So let's talk about productivity and motivation for a second. I know that with the beginning of a new year, a lot of us have goals of being more productive and doing more or being more motivated throughout our day, but sometimes it can be hard to know where to start. So with that, let me introduce you guys to something that has really helped me stop procrastinating and puts a pep in my step, and it is called Magic Mind. Magic Mind is the world's first productivity drink infused with 13 ingredients that work together to enhance your productivity, reduce your anxiety, elevate your mood and increase your mental energy without any of the unwanted jitters. Something that I've really been focusing on this year is creating a solid morning routine and being more mindful about what ingredients I'm putting into my body. And I've found that by starting my mornings with Magic Mind, it puts me in the perfect mindset to have a productive day and not need to rely on coffee to get me throughout my day. It also contains the ingredient L-thionine, which helps with reducing stress, which I think we could all use a little help with every once in a while. I actually loved Magic Mind so much that I shared a few of mine with my friends and now we've all incorporated Magic Mind into our daily routine. Now thankfully the Magic Mind team created a super offer for me to share with you guys. Only this January they will help you gear up to crush your 2024 New Year's resolutions fully focused. You will get one month for free when you're subscribing for three months at www.magicmind.com slash instinct and use my code KILLER. With this code, you will get an extra 20% off your order, which gets you in total 75% off. Now, this only lasts until the end of January, so hurry before it goes away. Hello everyone, what is up? Welcome back to another episode of Killer Instinct, you guys. Thank you so much for joining me here today. If you're new here, hi, my name is Savannah and I am your host of Killer Instinct. Before we get started, make sure you go ahead and hit that subscribe button, that way you never miss an episode. We post weekly on the podcast every single Wednesday, as well as upload the video version onto YouTube on Wednesdays as well, and you are not going to want to miss it. Now, before we jump into today's case, I did want to take a second and discuss what I referenced referenced last week in last week's episode in regards to dedicating each month to a different true crime category here on the podcast. Now, the majority of you, I was actually surprised, the majority of you loved this idea. So because of that, we are going to move forward in the foreseeable future doing that. So just to give you a quick recap, last week I approached you guys with the idea of dedicating each month moving forward to a different true crime category. So January is going to be unsolved cases. We'll have a month of international cases. We'll have a month of solved cases, serial killer cases, murderous women cases, so on and so forth. You get the drift. So I approached you guys with that idea last week and you were very much for the idea. So because of that, we are going to move forward with it. I'm very, very excited. And I do want to say if you are one of the ones who were not too thrilled about this idea, this is not going to be a forever thing. This is just going to be for the next couple months and we'll see how it goes from from there. So as I mentioned, this month we are focusing on unsolved cases, which is what brings us to our case today. As you can tell by the title of today's episode, today we are discussing the disappearance of Danielle Imbo and Richard Patron. This is an unsolved missing persons case that truly is going to make your head spin. It's not going to make sense. It's going to be one of those cases where we get to the end of it and you're like, Savannah, I need more than that. And I understand because that is how I felt doing my research on this case. You want more. You want more information because it just doesn't make sense. So I'm very interested to hear your theories on this case. And with that being said, let's jump right on into it. Now, before we jump into the case itself, I do want to take a second and talk about Danielle and Richard's physical appearance at the time that they went missing. At the time that they went missing, Danielle was standing at about five feet, five inches tall, weighing 120 pounds with brown hair and hazel eyes and was 34 years old at the time that she went missing. Danielle has a tattoo of flowers on her lower back and a small gap between her two front teeth. Richard, on the other hand, was five foot nine, weighing about 200 pounds with brown hair and blue eyes. He had several clown tattoos, wore eyeglasses, and had a beard and a mustache at the time that he went missing at 35 years old. 
Now, with that being said, let's jump into the case. Danielle was born on August 7th, 1970 to her parents, John and Felice, in South Philadelphia. Now, Danielle's father was actually a part of a band that rose to fame in the 1950s called The Four Dates, and her dad, John, went by the stage name Johnny October. Growing up and watching her dad being immersed in the music business is what introduced Danielle to her love of music and where she began developing a passion for singing and also loved attending different concerts. Along with that, another one of Danielle's passions included reading, and more specifically, her favorite types of books to read were murder mystery books. At the time of her disappearance, Danielle was working from home as a loan processor while simultaneously being a lead singer of a pop rock band called The Schoolboys, hoping to fulfill her dream and follow in her dad's footsteps of making it in the music industry. In 2003, Danielle decided to put her pop star dreams to the side when she welcomed her son, Joe Jr., into the world. Now, in 2003, Joe and Danielle were living in Mount Laurel, New Jersey, and this should have been a very happy time for the two of them. For Joe and Danielle, they just welcomed their beautiful boy into the world, and this was supposed to be a very joyous and exciting chapter in their lives. However, in 2004, Joe ended up going to Texas for the Super Bowl. He took a trip to Texas, and Danielle and the baby stayed home because their son had a cold. So Danielle said that she would stay at home and take care of the baby while Joe went to the Super Bowl. This was a trip that they had pre-planned. Joe was very excited about it. And Danielle said, no worries, you go and I'll stay back. Not knowing that when Joe made his return, he would completely blindside Danielle in asking her for a divorce, saying that he met someone else on this trip to Texas and he was going to go start a relationship with them. Now, as you can imagine, when Danielle heard this, this was absolutely devastating for her. She had pictured spending her entire life with Joe and they had their son who was not even a year old at this point. However, Joe was adamant in his decision for a divorce. And so because of this, Danielle had to figure out her new normal. She had to rewire her entire life. She started rapidly losing weight. She wasn't sleeping. She began chain smoking, which was something she had not done before. And she was trying to adapt herself to a life that she felt did a complete 180. So the first thing that she decided to do was move out of the home and move into a condo in Mount Laurel, New Jersey with her son. Now, while Danielle was trying to pick up the pieces with the support of her family and her friends, that is when she reconnected with 35-year-old Richard Patron. Now, Richard was born on August 29th, 1969 in Philadelphia to his parents, Richard and Margaret. Richard is described as being a hardworking family man. He was actually working at his family's bakery at the time of his disappearance, and that bakery was called Viking Pastries. Similarly to Danielle, Richard also had a child. He had a daughter, and he was actually raising his daughter in an apartment that was above the bakery, which was super convenient for him because his work was right downstairs, and he was able to go back up and spend time with his daughter and raise her there. So it was a very convenient situation. And Richard and Danielle, they had actually known each other for quite some time. This was not something that was new at all. Richard and Danielle had actually grown up in the same neighborhood together and had known each other for most of their lives. And even though Danielle lost touch with Richard over the years, Danielle did remain very, very close friends with Richard's sister, Christine. And shortly after Danielle and Joe split, Richard and Danielle rekindled their friendship, which very quickly developed into a romantic relationship. According to Richard's daughter, who was a teenager at the time, she said Danielle was, quote, the first girl that he had ever really fell in love with and wanted to dedicate his time to end quote. Now, even though Richard and Danielle were very happy and they were hopeful for the future, Danielle wasn't entirely certain and sure about the pace that things were going and was worried that things were moving a little too fast with Richard. Danielle was just coming out of a divorce and for her, she was worried that she and Richard shouldn't be necessarily seeing each other just yet. But again, that wasn't due to a lack of feelings. Danielle was more so worried that because she was going through a divorce, 
divorce with a young child. She should just focus on getting through that and really just prioritize her son and spend her time with him because he was a toddler at the time. However, her feelings for Richard were still very strong. I want to emphasize that. This wasn't because she had a lack of feelings for Richard. She just felt like the time wasn't right. She wasn't ready to fully dedicate herself to another relationship. Now, Richard, on the other hand, he was head over heels for Danielle, like I said. But ultimately, when Danielle told him that the two of them needed to kind of take a step back and take a break for some time, Richard respected her feelings and distanced himself from her, hoping that the two in the future could potentially connect again. Now, according to Danielle's friends, Danielle was in a very good place when she broke things off with Richard. She actually described it as a weight being lifted off of her shoulders because she didn't want to feel like she was stringing Richard along, didn't want to feel guilty if she couldn't spend time with him. And a big thing for Danielle was that she was not ready to get married again. She wasn't actually sure that she wanted to get married ever again. And that was something that Richard really wanted. He wanted to get married. And so because of that, Danielle also felt like what they wanted in the future, their desires for what the future looks like, it wasn't going to align. Now, in the beginning of 2005, Joe, who was Danielle's soon-to-be ex-husband, decided that he wanted to come back and attempted to repair the relationship with Danielle. He decided that he wanted to get back together. Now, this was primarily because the relationship that he left Danielle for failed. So once the relationship failed, he ran back to Danielle, telling her that he wanted to repair the relationship. However, at this point, Danielle told him that it was too late and she was done. Besides the obvious of Joe leaving Danielle for another woman, there were also other problems in their marriage. And this included Joe's alleged short temper and alleged controlling behavior behavior that Danielle was open about to her friends. So by the time Joe came running back to Danielle, she was confident in her decision. And as you can imagine, Joe was not very happy with this decision. Now, this all brings us to February 19th, 2005. This was a Saturday night, and on this night, Richard had gone out to dinner alone. He went out and grabbed a bite to eat, grabbed a few drinks, and he decided that he wanted to then go and listen to some live music on South Street in Philadelphia. Now, South Street is known for its active nightlife with bars and restaurants and live music. It's a very popular spot. Now, because Richard wanted to go listen to some live music, he decided to call his sister Christine and extend an invitation to her and see if she wanted to join him for the night. However, Christine declined the offer, but instead Christine told Richard that she was actually with Danielle at the time. Danielle, Christine, and both of their moms had gone out to dinner together, and so instead of Christine going, Christine said, let me ask Danielle, and Danielle agreed to go. Now, at this time, Richard and Danielle hadn't seen each other for a few weeks, so it had been some time apart, but Richard was still very, very excited to see Danielle. So because of this, Richard got in his car and drove over to the restaurant where Danielle was to pick her up, and then the two of them were going to go to South Street together, which is exactly what they did. Now, Joe was actually taking care of their son at the time. It was his weekend for visitation, and so he had their son. So Danielle was able to go out and do as she pleased this night. Now, Richard drove over to the restaurant, picks up Danielle, and drives over to South Street in his 2001 Black Dodge Dakota truck. Now, when they arrived to South Street, the bar that they went to was called Abilene's. And when they went, they met up with two of Richard's friends. These friends were named Anthony Valentino and Michelle McLaughlin. So now it's the four of them, Anthony, Michelle, Richard and Danielle. They're all at this bar together listening to this live music until approximately 1145 when Anthony and Michelle asked if Danielle and Richard would like to go to another bar. However, Danielle and Richard declined the offer saying that Danielle had a lot of things that she needed to get done the next day. She didn't want to be out too late. So Richard and Danielle were going to go home and go back to Danielle's house. So at this point, the two couples said goodbye to each other and 
Richard and Danielle left the bar, not knowing that this would be the last time that they would ever see each other again. So let's talk about productivity and motivation for a second. I know that with the beginning of a new year, a lot of us have goals of being more productive and doing more or being more motivated throughout our day, but sometimes it can be hard to know where to start. So with that, let me introduce you guys to something that has really helped me stop procrastinating and puts a pep in my step, and it is called Magic Mind. Magic Mind is the world's first productivity drink infused with 13 ingredients that work together to enhance your productivity, reduce your anxiety, elevate your mood, and increase your mental energy without any of the unwanted jitters. Something that I've really been focusing on this year is creating a solid morning routine and being more mindful about what ingredients I'm putting into my body. And I've found that by starting my mornings with Magic Mind, it puts me in the perfect mindset to have a productive day and not need to rely on coffee to get me throughout my day. It also contains the ingredient L-thionine, which helps with reducing stress, which I think we could all use a little help with every once in a while. I actually loved Magic Mind so much that I shared a few of mine with my friends, and now we've all incorporated Magic Mind into our daily routine. Now, thankfully, the Magic Mind team created a super offer for me to share with you guys. Only this January, they will help you gear up to crush your 2024 New Year's resolutions fully focused. You will get one month for free when you're subscribing for three months at www.magicmind.com slash jankillerinstinct and use my code killer. With this code, you will get an extra 20% off your order, which gets you in total 75% off. Now this only lasts until the end of January, so hurry before it goes away. Now, the next day on February 20th, Danielle actually had a hair appointment scheduled and her hair appointment was scheduled for 11 a.m. in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. And Richard's sister, Christine, actually worked at this hair salon. So she was expecting to see Danielle that morning. However, Danielle never showed up for her appointment. Now, this was very much unlike Danielle. She wouldn't just miss an appointment like this without calling or texting Christine. So Christine called Danielle's phone, however, did not not get an answer. And this is when the concern really started to set in for her. Now, another reason that Christine knew that Danielle wouldn't just miss this appointment is because later that day at 3.30, Joe was actually scheduled to go to Danielle's condo and bring her their son and drop him off with Danielle. And so because of that, Danielle told Christine the night before all of the things that she had to do to get prepared for her son to be dropped back off. So for her to just no call, no show to this appointment did not make sense. Now, Richard's mom also called Richard several times that day on his home phone and his cell phone. Now, Richard's mom did not know that Danielle did not show up to her hair appointment, but she knew that Richard was just planning on spending the day at home at his apartment because he wanted to watch the Daytona 500 race on television that afternoon. So because of that, Richard should have been able to answer to his phone, whether that be his cell phone or his home phone, he should have been able to pick up the phone. However, throughout the day, he was not answering either of these phones. And so the family and friends of both Danielle and Richard both became increasingly worried that neither of them were answering the phone and no one had seen or heard from them. Now, a little bit before 3.30, Danielle's brother, John, actually decided to drive over to Danielle's condo just to see what was going on, to see if she was there. He did have the spare key, so he would be able to get into her condo, which he did. And upon walking into the condo, everything looked normal normal. Nothing seemed out of place. Nothing seemed ransacked. There didn't seem to be any sign of a struggle. There wasn't sign of any forced entry. The front door was still locked. The only thing that was odd was that Danielle was not there. Her car was still there, but Danielle was not. And once 3.30 rolled around and Joe showed up with their son, Danielle's brother was still at the condo and he initially tried to make up some story as to why Danielle wasn't there at the time because he didn't want Joe to be able to use this in the future against Danielle saying that she wasn't there when he went to drop off their son just he didn't want to give him any extra ammo to have to use it against Danielle in the future so he tried to make up some story as to why Danielle wasn't there at the time but this is when her family knew that something was incredibly wrong because Danielle would not have missed being there to pick up her son it just would not have happened so it was at this time that her family called the police to file a missing persons report for Danielle now initially the police 
were not concerned. They did not think that there was anything wrong here. They figured that Danielle had just gone out for a wild night. She had slept in. She would return later. However, her family knew that that was not the case here and that this was not like Danielle. Now, it was through this process of calling to report Danielle missing that Danielle's family started reaching out to Richard's family, and that is when they learned that Richard also had not been seen or heard from, and so Richard's family also called the police to file a missing persons report for him as well. Now, with this news that both families are now realizing that both Richard and Danielle are missing, they really are trying to work together in the beginning to find out what happened. They immediately start making missing persons flyers and start passing them out to everyone on South Street. They were searching the bar and the surrounding streets of the area that they were last seen in. They also drove the route that Richard would have drove when taking Danielle home, but found nothing. Danielle's father even hired a helicopter pilot to fly overhead and search for Danielle, Richard, or Richard's truck. However, nothing was found. In addition to looking for Richard and Danielle, police were also searching for Richard's truck. So that is really where police began in this investigation was looking for this truck. They were looking at the Philadelphia International Airport. They were looking in parking lots. However, in every search, they were unsuccessful in finding this truck. Now, at this point, police really shifted their focus and they looked into the Delaware River. And the reason for this is because this was the nearest body of water to where Danielle and Richard were last seen. After Danielle and Richard went missing, there were actually several psychics who reached out to Danielle's family. And one of them was convinced that Richard's truck was under the Walt Whitman Bridge. And that is a bridge that connects Philadelphia to New Jersey. And this psychic also claimed that Danielle was still alive and trapped in this car. So as you can imagine, when Danielle's family hears this, they really urged police to look into the Delaware River and specifically look under the bridge. And even though police did, and they did recover several vehicles in this search, none of them were Richard's and Richard and Danielle were still missing. Now, in the beginning of the investigation, there was a 12,200 reward offered to anyone who would bring forward any information that would lead to Danielle and Richard's whereabouts, and that number soon increased to $100,000. Now, police spoke with Anthony and Michelle, the two friends that were with Danielle and Richard that night, and according to them, everything seemed fine between Danielle and Richard. In fact, the two of them seemed very, very happy. They were hugging, they were kissing throughout the night, they seemed very couple and flirty. It just, nothing seemed wrong. They didn't seem like they were in distress. Neither of them seemed worried. And because Anthony and Michelle were Richard's friends, this was actually the first time that they had ever met Danielle. However, they had heard about her many, many times before and told police that Richard always spoke very highly of Michelle. He always put her on this pedestal, always just had the best things to say about her. And Anthony and Michelle seemed to really like her as well. So when talking to police, Anthony and Michelle emphasized that nothing seemed wrong that night and that when Danielle and Richard left the bar together, they seemed to be very relaxed and in a good mood. However, little would anyone know this would be the last time that the two of them would ever be seen again. Now, it'll probably be no surprise to you when I tell you that initially the first person that police looked into in this investigation was Danielle's husband, Joe. Now, Joe did have a pretty rock solid alibi for the night of the 19th. And that alibi was, according to him, he had spent the night at a family friend's house. And this family friend was a man named Alex Schur. And Alex lived in Tom's River at the time, which was in New Jersey. It was about 50 to 60 miles away from where Richard and Danielle were that night. Now, Joe also claimed that his mom and his stepfather were there too, along with their son. Now, Joe's stepfather, Mike Cuomo, was a retired police officer. And Alex was also a retired NYPD detective. So they definitely have ties in law enforcement. Now, a lot of people were suspicious about this alibi, thinking that, of course, your family, your family friend, they're all going to vouch for you. They're all going to vouch for Joe and say that they were with him that night. So Joe decided to volunteer and take a polygraph test. However, the results of these tests came back inconclusive. Now, police started to talk to Danielle's friends to get a better understanding about her relationship with Joe. And when doing so, the police learned that Joe was not happy whatsoever learning that Danielle had moved on with Richard. In fact, they said that Joe had reached out to Richard personally multiple times. They would call his cell phone.
phone. He would call his home phone. And he would even call Richard's bakery business, the family bakery business, to tell him to leave Danielle alone. Now, it was also revealed that Joe was accessing Danielle's voicemail in the months prior to her disappearance. And that was how he was able to learn about who Danielle was talking to, who she was seeing. And it was also discovered that Joe was looking into Danielle's social media accounts pretty actively in the days leading up to her disappearance as well. Danielle's friends also told police about one instance where Danielle claimed that Joe got very heated in an argument between the two of them and ended up throwing their son's high chair across the room and into a wall. And they were really doing this to help hone in on the nature of Danielle and Joe's relationship from Danielle's perspective. Again, this is what Danielle is telling her friends. And according to Danielle's friends, they allege that Danielle was saying that, again, Joe had a hot temper. He was very controlling, even to the extent where at one point, Danielle's brother, John, had to sit down with Joe and have a conversation because Danielle expressed to John that she was worried for her safety. She was worried that Joe would not take no for an answer in regards to the divorce and was worried about his behavior. And John did go and have that sit down conversation with him. But again, that more so just shows Danielle's state of mind when it comes to the relationship between her and Joe. Now, with that all being said, it should be noted that Danielle's friends have said that they do not believe that Joe would have done anything to hurt Danielle. So because of that, police were then looking at other theories. Now, both Danielle and Richard's family, as well as the police, did not believe that this was the case of just some random attack. But with that, they also didn't know who was the target in this attack because you have two people. So were both Danielle and Richard the target? Was Danielle the target? Was Richard the target? Which one of them was in the wrong place at the wrong time? It really just brought up a lot more questions. And because of this, over time, sadly, Danielle and Richard's families really began to turn on each other and start pointing fingers. When it came to Danielle's family, they thought it was possible that Richard knew the wrong people, was hanging out in the wrong crowd, and maybe that happened. Had something to do with it. When it came to Richard's family, they thought that Joe was responsible and that Joe had something to do with it and that Richard was in the wrong place at the wrong time. So because of that, it really caused a divide between these two families. Now, I do want to mention, just because I feel like we have to mention this, the theory that Danielle and Richard, you know, ran off together into the sunset and decided to never look back, never looked back for their children or anything like that, that was never a plausible theory here. That was never a theory that was really looked into for a multitude of reasons. First off, and the most important one was their kids. Everyone who knew both Danielle and Richard knew that neither of them would have just up and left their kids like that. Their kids were their whole world. They were their priority. And so the idea that the two of them would just up and leave everything, including their other family members, it just was not the case. Both of these people were incredibly family oriented and they prioritized their children and they were not going to compromise that and decide to just run off together and start a new life. So that immediately from the very beginning was pushed to the side. Now, there was another theory that police looked into in the beginning, and that was that this could have been a potential carjacking, that Danielle and Richard could have been victims of a carjacking gone wrong. In the year leading up to Danielle and Richard's disappearance, the carjacking in that location, those rates had skyrocketed. In that year of leading up to their disappearance, there had been 13,000 carjackings reported, and police learned that these carjackers would then take these cars and and sell the pieces or would put them through shredders if they needed to, thinking that this could have been a potential carjacking situation and that these carjackers could have put Richard's truck through the car shredder with Danielle and Richard in the truck, and that is why they have never been found. However, other than just this being a theory, there was no evidence to support this. And also, when the police really started looking into this theory, they found it to be more and more unlikely for several reasons. First off, a carjacker was not likely to to carjack when there were two victims present. They more than likely were going to do it with only one because it's easier. And second of all, carjackers typically don't keep the victims in the car. They want to get the victims out of the car, however they may have to do it, but they're not going to keep them in the car. It's actually more work for them to keep the bodies in the car, to keep the victims in the car with them. And so because of that, it just did not make a lot of sense. Now, along with that, I also want to point out the fact that on the night of the 19th, no one knew, and to this day, 
way, no one knows where Richard parked that night. So they couldn't pull up cameras to see what exactly happened. If that were to be the case, they could not pull up if Richard and Danielle even ever made it to the car because they do not know where he parked. Now, the FBI was involved in this case pretty much from the very beginning, and in 2008, they made a pretty shocking announcement when they announced that they believed that Richard and Danielle were a part of a murder-for-hire plot. Now, to this day, they have not come forward and expressed what makes them believe this or why they think this to be the case. They have not provided evidence to back this up. However, we have to believe that the FBI would not just be shooting in the dark on this if they did not have any sort of evidence to back up this theory. The direct quote from FBI Special Agent Roselle made in 2014 stated, quote, making two people in a truck disappear with no witnesses and no evidence of any kind for nine years suggests methodical planning. It's possible a perpetrator could just get lucky, but it's more likely just what it looks like. Someone behind this knew what they were doing, end quote. So that is a very strong statement to be made, as you can imagine. However, it does make the most sense sense to have both Richard and Danielle go missing pretty much without a trace. As I said earlier, it seemed like they vanished in thin air. It seemed like they almost fell off the face of the earth. Just one night they walked out of that bar and no one ever saw them again. It seems methodical. It seems strategic. It seems premeditated. And that's what's interesting about this because when thinking about how premeditated this seems, thinking about how planned this seems, the entire night between Richard and Danielle, this was not something that was planned. This was a last minute event. This, these were last minute plans that were made between Richard and Danielle. Richard and Danielle did not know that they were going to see each other that night until about an hour before they did, which brings up the theory of was one of them the target and one of them for lack of a better word, collateral damage. Was Richard the target and they had to get rid of Danielle because the two of them were together or vice versa? Was Danielle the target and they had to get rid of Richard because the two of them were together? Now, in spring of 2022, there was a privately funded dive team from Oregon called Adventures with Purpose that announced that they were going to search the Delaware River again, and they did so in March 2022. Now, Adventures with Purpose had previously taken on 36 missing persons cases in 2021 and actually found 11 missing persons people. So they went into the Delaware River hoping to find anything that could give them an answer. And this did seem to the families like a new beam of hope. They thought that, you know, going into the Delaware River again with this new set of eyes, this new dive team, maybe this could help give them their answers. However, the only answer that was found was that they were almost certain after searching that Richard's truck, Danielle, and Richard were not in that river. There was nothing that was found in that river. A direct quote from the founder of Adventures with Purpose said, quote, we've covered everything now from Dave and Buster's all the way down from the Ben Franklin Bridge down to Whitman Bridge. If anything, I can turn to the family and say, I feel 99.867% sure that they are not within this area. And that, you guys, is really where we stand today on this case. I know I told you from the beginning, we're going to get to the end of it and you're going to be like, no, there has to be more. I agree. You would think there would be more. There's no more answers that have been released to the public. Now, like I mentioned, I do think it's important to note the FBI are very confident with their theory that this was a murder for hire plot. They would not release that information to the public if they did not have the information to back it up. That is just information that has not been released yet. Now, currently, this case is open and being actively investigated by the FBI, the Philadelphia and New Jersey Police Departments, as well as the Mount Laurel Police Department and Burlington County Prosecutor's Office. Danielle and Richard did not just disappear off the face of the earth, even though it may seem like it. If there's one thing that we know for sure is that someone out there knows something, whether they saw something, whether they were involved, whether they heard something, someone out there knows 
something and i'm very interested to hear what you guys have to say about this case so with that being said you guys that is all for me today thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of killer instinct please let me know what you think about this case i'm very very curious to hear your theories but again with that being said that is all for me here again if you are new here hi my name is savannah and i'm your host of killer instinct make sure you go ahead and hit that subscribe button that way you never miss an episode we post weekly here every wednesday on the podcast you're not going to want to miss it i'll be back next week with a brand new one for you guys and until then stay safe. Bye guys.